Welcome to the Man of Honor podcast with your host, former NFL player, Pastor Ed Tandy McGlasson. On today's episode, Ed sits down with Pastor Nathan Hornback of Livingstone's Church in Elko, Nevada, who has two adopted daughters. And now, here's Ed. Well, welcome to the Man of Honor podcast. Yes, I am wearing the world champion Los Angeles Rams jersey. My number, I wish I was on that team. I'd have gotten a bigger ring, but I got the biggest ring. It's my wedding ring. And so it's a it's awesome. Can't can't get it off though. That's it's it's shrunk in the wash. But anyway, for another time. Today we got uh, just uh, an amazing young squire, a man who's just uh, all in in his call in life, family. His uh, name is Pastor Nathan Hornback. Is it back right, Hornback? Yeah, no, you you got it right. Most people don't, so great job. Yeah, he's a lead pastor of Living Stones Church in Elko. It's out there where lizards live, way out there in Nevada. He's married to uh, his sweetheart, Aubrey, 16 years. You're looking at him going, that guy doesn't look that old. And he's got two <laughs> beautiful you. adopted girls. Incredible story. Finley and uh, Lenai, right? Uh, just Lenny. Oh, yeah, Lenny. Yeah. Okay, L Lenny. Finley and Lenny. I thought we were going with Hawaiian groove there. He uh, planted his church 10 years ago, and uh, they got a wonderful uh, website, messages, and Facebook presence. Incredible. So welcome, uh, Nathan, to the Man of Honor podcast. I'm a, it's an honor to have you on the show. And uh, somehow they shrunk you in the screen and made me bigger. I'm not sure how that works. You must hey, maybe that helps with me looking a little younger. You know, we're not so uh, we're not so zoomed in. So <laughs> I'll take it. That's awesome, brother. So let's talk a little bit about just your incredible story about how you came to uh, being a pastor of this church and kind of your your whole place of becoming a dad and adopting girls. So tell me a yeah. little bit about your story with your dad, kind of growing up and. And then we'll get into it. Yeah, man, it's a uh, man going from growing up to being a dad now. Such a it's just a story of amazing grace. I think like most of our stories are right. Um, but yeah, I was very fortunate to be raised in a Christian home. Uh, my mom and dad loved Jesus. My dad actually served in ministry in uh, Fresno and Visalia, California area. That's actually where I was born. And uh, my dad was a youth pastor down there and kind of just was important to our family that we uh, mm -hmm. kids were raised to know and love Jesus. And uh, I'm very thankful for that, even though he had to drag me out the door some Sunday mornings. I'm thankful he did, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and, and, you know, with my dad, his story is even a miracle because my dad's dad, my grandpa, um, God just, he, he lived the majority of his life as an unbeliever and was hate. I mean, hated God. We can just say it. Um, and then there was an Easter Sunday where God saved my grandpa and saved my grandma. And then that of course led to my dad knowing Jesus. And then here I am by some miraculous miracle. I, if you can say miraculous and miracle back to back, I'm a pastor, which is amazing. Mm. Um, and so I'm just thankful for a legacy of faithfulness and that it mattered uh, to my parents to, to to raise us to know and love Jesus. And I'm just trying to keep that going with my little girls, you know? Well, you know, that's, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people today, you know, only 18.9% um, of kids went to bed last night with their mom and their dad in their story. Man. And, you know, in the same home. <laughs> And so there's something about having a present dad and mom who, no matter how they start their story, they stay together and they learn and then discover Jesus. Yeah. And now their, their son and now their grandkids are living in a whole new legacy in the way they began. Oh, man. It, yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. It's the power of the gospel. Only yeah. Jesus does that. Well, it's like uh, your name of your church, Living Stones, right? Yeah. 
you know, we're planted on the living stone, Christ. He's the chief cornerstone. But God's made uh, our families to be, God created families so that his blessing could travel from father to daughter to son, from mother to daughter to son, and then to grandchildren and to great-grandchildren. That was God's That's answer right. to, to for the cure of broken families, to That's be a right. father in those broken families by saving the kids. And now yeah. you're not living out that legacy. What an incredible story. And I remember in our in our pre-interview, you you also wanted to have your own kind of uh, kids, you know, and so you kind of tried for a while. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I married my high school sweetheart, Audrey. She, we were, we met when we were, gosh, I think like 12 years old at a Christian <laughs> school. And, you know, she was the the beautiful, popular girl and I was the nerd. And, you know, <laughs> I never thought I had a chance in the world with that girl. And, uh, you know, but I, I really, I mean, this, this, I tell this to people and they say it's weird for a, a 15 year old, but I actually had a moment with the Lord uh, in in high school. I uh, I was watching my fellow classmates and students like just, you know, it's high school, dating each other, breaking up with each other. I was watching everybody, like the girls particularly were crying. The boys were just psychopaths. And I'm 15 years old and I literally prayed to God. I said, God, I believe that you are big enough and good enough mm. to show me the girl I'm going to marry and, and not let me have to do this mm. game that I see here mm. at 15 years old. And uh, so I, I just surrendered it to the Lord. And I said, I don't want to play games. I want the girl that you have for me. And uh, little did I know it was going to be the girl I thought I'd never get. But I was, I was standing up uh, on the top of a parking lot of our school, which was in our church building. And I was looking down kind of the parking lot to the rear door. And uh, Audrey, my now wife, walked out of the door. And of course, she's beautiful. So I'm watching her from the top parking lot. And her dad, um, John Fosmo, he just passed away a few years ago from cancer. He was a godly, godly man. He was a sheriff. He pulled up next to me in his sheriff rig. I was, my heart was boom, 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 boom. <laughs> he, he rolls down his window, Ed, and I kid you not, he looks at me. He looks down at his daughter and he looks back at me. And the first things that I can remember him ever saying to me was this. He said, boy, you better sweep her off her feet before it's too late. Oh, my God. That's goodness. straight what he said. I'm, oh. I'm not even I'm not kidding you, man. So I was panicking. And uh, so I did the whole I asked her to be my girlfriend on Valentine's Day when we were 16 and somehow God moved and she said yes. And we got married when we were 19 and we've been together ever since. Uh, what, so, a, what a great fishing technique for all the dads right. out there to help your daughter make a choice. Oh man. Like I was like, I was feeling confident because I had her dad's approval, you know? I was yeah. Like, but you had to get her here? approval, which is a lot harder. Oh, oh man. Dude, I, I went, I went hard. I went rom-com status at 16. I baked her a cake. I, I got her gifts and I was just doing everything I could because I wanted that girl. Um, uh, well, so. you know, we uh, I remember when uh, Jessica was dating a, uh, a wrong guy in high school. Yeah. And he came over to uh, see her. And so I met him at the front door and I looked at him and I said, uh, son, um, after uh, uh, further consideration, you do not have permission to date my daughter, touch my daughter, pursue my daughter, call my daughter. And as her father, I'm telling you no. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Let's now, he, he was an Orange County Sheriff's son. Oh. So you think he'd know about authority. And he goes, <laughs> well, I, I just, I know I, I'm crossing lines and stuff, but I promise, blah, 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 blah. I said, son... I'll spell it for you. N O. Right. So he leaves, and Jessica's cell phone rings, and I happen to have it in my pocket. Oh, here we go. And I picked it up, and I said, "Can you not spell?" 
<laughs> it's a really simple no. Without my permission, my daughter will not go out with you, see you, talk to you. Do you understand me? Sir? Oh, yeah. Fine. Click. <laughs> Ooh. Now, my daughter gave me permission to do that. But she is so grateful that I stepped in as a dad to help. Oh, when absolutely. her heart was entangled in the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> oh, sure. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> so anyway, so you're pursuing her. What was the final, you know, what was the final thing that finally got her to go, yes? You know, uh, I'm, this is not going to be very spiritual, Ed, but it's one of the things I'm most thankful for. Her... Uh, loser boyfriend before me broke up with her and mm. i think i was kind of a rebound so i'm just thankful for that thank god for rebound relationships because uh i got the girl um <laughs> but uh yeah it was uh it was just great man and we we both love the lord and and we both just uh i mean the, the thing about her i'm getting to the children part but the thing about her she just has always been my best friend mm. like i've just i've just always loved her um, yeah, I just, it's making me think back, you know, six, 18 years ago when we were dating and she just brought so much joy to my life. And mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to spend forever with her. And, uh, you know, as I became part of that family, um, a Christ centered godly family and, uh, we, we grew and, um, I learned, you know, that my wife was adopted, um, uh, by her parents. She was adopted out of Oklahoma city. And uh, they, her parents, John and Carol, had one son uh, biologically. His name was Ryan. But then they also weren't able to have, like, more children easily. So uh, they made the choice to adopt. Uh, and so when Audrey and I started dating and got married, we had always talked about carrying on kind of a legacy of adoption. Uh, because not only was she, Audrey, adopted, but her mom was adopted as well. And so we were like, man, what a, what a, you know, we're 18. So we're just talking, but we're like, what a, a beautiful thing to continue one day. Um, and little did we know that uh, we would get married at 19 and uh, we would try and try and try and try and not be able to conceive. And then six years later, my wife would conceive uh, mm. just everything was great. And uh, we rolled into the hospital uh, one afternoon for just a routine checkup. And I think I think I should have double checked with my wife. I think it was 17 weeks along. Mm. And uh, we were happy. We walked in the hospital room. The doctor put the ultrasound on. And there was just this tangible moment that's hard to explain unless mm -hmm. you've lived it. Um, where the doctor just kind of like you could see the posture change and looked up at us and said, uh, I can't find a heartbeat. Wow. And, uh, we, you know, I think the first thing is just denial. There's an incredible rush of adrenaline and fear. And it's like, well, well, and then he says, well, let me look again. Let me try, uh, you know, whatever it's something different. And, and we just sat there in that room and just this wave of grief and loss came over us. And, uh, and then, of course, we were the I think the worst part, Ed, was we were so far along that um, we actually had to go through a delivery. Um, mm. And uh, my wife had to go through all of that, you know, just to have loss at the end of it. And uh, it was devastating. Um, I, I was really we were really, really angry with the Lord. Um just, I was just, I remember just, I remember driving about 20 miles up to the Canyon here and go and yelling at the Lord. Um, you know, I was just going, God, like I, I'm, I'm doing everything I can do. I'm a pastor. You know, I was just, I was trying to, to prove to God that I was somehow worthy of this. And, and I was just telling him like, you know, why can, why can other people have children who don't want them? Cause you know, I've met with people in my office here who are, were pregnant again. And, you know, they're, they're happy, but they're, they're like, it was unplanned. And what are we going to do? And here we are trying with everything we are, you know, to have a child and we can't. And so I just remember going to the Lord and just why, and how could you do this? And I just, why won't you let my wife be a mom? She's going to be a beautiful mother. And just, 
you know, hashing it out. And, and the thing about that, Ed, was I tell people God never uh, gave me a sign or showed me a shape in the clouds or spoke to me audibly. I just remember coming down the mountain and I felt the spirit of the Lord kind of just join me right where I was in my hurt. And, uh, and somehow the peace that passes understanding mm. became something that leapt off of the t-shirts and off of the coffee cups and, and really just rested on my heart. And I just heard the Lord say, I know you don't get it. You know, like I felt that he was going to say, but I'm going to bring beauty out of this oh, wow. and, uh, came down and told my wife and, uh, you know, that doesn't help in the moment, especially when she's hurting biologically and going through a lot of that. Mm. Um, yeah. Karen, but baby, we like a full term baby, right. You know, having to go through a full term delivery at, at, you know, 15, 17 weeks. Yeah. It, it, it was just all of the biology said I'm having a baby, but all of the result was, you know, not life. And so there mm. wasn't a, a, a connection, a life giving connection that could be made. And so it, it was really devastating. And, you know, I think when we were journeying through that, we were, we were saying things like, um, I think you try to, you try to move around the pain, right. Especially in your relationship with the Lord. Like I, I felt like we were, we were trying to bring things in to, to kind of soften the blow. And then that was when we actually kind of shifted and said, well, maybe, this is God's invitation to focus on adoption, right? Um, because we didn't have the money uh, to go get poked and prodded and all the tests done and figure out why and, you know, a lot of that stuff. And honestly, I didn't want to put my wife through most of that. Mm. Um, so we just said, you know what? We're going to trust the Lord with what happened. And we're going to keep trying to have a child of our own. And all the while, um, adoption was on our hearts. Mm. And uh, well, he put that sadly inside of you, right? Oh it's, man, it's since the we most were eighteen profound, years old. You know, people see adoption as well. That's an alternative. It's oh, yeah. the same. But the truth of the matter, when Paul writes that understanding of that God shows us before the foundation of the world, he he uses a the word "shows," which was a legal word in law in Rome that as a parent, you could actually get rid of your children mm -hmm. up to eight years old. You could just say, I don't want them anymore. Talking about a brutal, uh, aborting a child that, out of your family all the way to eight years old. And then, but if you volitionally chose to adopt that child, you could never go back on that. Right. And so the son or daughter actually got something added into their name as adopted child, more than a son, more than a daughter. Oh, I because love it. Because you chose that girl or that boy to be yours. And because you volitionally chose, you can't go back on that, which ties back into that God chose you and me before oh, the foundation of the world to adopt us as sons and daughters. That's so right. The greatest move of a parent is not just having a making a baby, but it's receiving one. <laughs> oh man, it, that is so beautiful. Ed like and that 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 was it. Like a couple months later, she actually got pregnant again, but it ended up being a, an ectopic pregnancy um, that wasn't oh, that didn't man. go through. It was brutal, man. Like we, of course, her body responds as if pregnant yet again. <laughs> and the doctors are saying, it's not this, it's not going to happen. And so it, we, we go through it a second time. And, and again, even to this day, we've still never prevented pregnancy naturally. But what happened was what you said in the midst of pain, like at loss of children, the, the love of adoption that God put in our hearts and in my wife's story just grew and grew and grew until, you know, by just a working out of grace, we got to adopt my first daughter. Um, and it, it's funny because if you see her, 
uh, my daughter Finley, nobody believes us that we adopted her because she looks just like my <laughs> wife. And uh, you know, I remember this, Ed. We were in uh, we were in <laughs> Twin Falls, Idaho. We were in Twin Falls, Idaho, with with our little girl. She was just a, a couple a couple months old in a car seat, and we were checking out in a Target. And I just thought this was the Lord, man. I felt like this was straight from, straight from the Lord. Uh, I'm pushing the car seat through the checkout, and this sweet old lady who I found out is a believer comes over and looks in the car seat at our little girl looks at me, looks up at my wife, and the sweet lady looks right at me, and she goes, what a gift from the Lord. This little girl looks just like you, and and I just kind of laughed, and I said, hey, thank you so much, but actually, you know, she's adopted, and that old lady put her hand on me, looked right in my eyes, and she said, hey, Jesus made this little girl for you. Oh, my God. He wanted you to be this girl's daddy, and he she looked at my wife, and she goes, she wanted you to be this girl's mommy she's been waiting for you and so of course i'm uh, bawling in target right you know i'm crying my wife's crying and uh man it has just been such an amazing gift to have my to have my daughter yeah um, and who and who knows how you know because god knew that little girl before he made the world and knew the parent she needed he somehow used the genetics of history and this couple that you had not met to produce a baby that will look just like you. <laughs> uh, just, right. I mean, how amazing is the Lord? I can't. Oh, he and, is. Then, and then uh, it's just incredible. And then with my second daughter, like we get the other side of the beauty of this is she looks nothing like us. She's a little blonde haired, blue eyed, smartest kid I've ever met in my life. Little firecracker. Oh yeah. She's and, firecracker. Uh, <laughs> oh man. But she like, she was, you know, unplanned by us, but not by the Lord. I mean, I, I shared this with you a little bit, but, um, one year after we were, we got Finley celebrated her one year birthday. Um, I went home in between services on a Sunday afternoon and, uh, a car pulled in our driveway that neither me or my wife recognized. A uh, woman got out of the car with, a, I think she was seven weeks uh, old in a car seat. This little girl knocked on our door. My wife opened up the door and this lady was crying. And my wife started to think, maybe I recognize this lady. I don't know who this is. But she looked at my wife and crying and said, can you take care of my child? I'll call you after work. And she set the little girl down on the car seat and was never seen or heard from again. Oh, wow. And so my wife and I are standing there in my living room with our one-year-old daughter and this really sickly looking little girl that in this car seat. And we're standing there and we're kind of looking at each other like, what, do, what just happened? And uh, we became, we called the Department of Child Family Services. We became emergency mm. foster parents. And then month after month after month for 18 months, we carried this little girl to a courtroom. And, uh, you know, as, as we cared for her, we grew to love her as our own. And, but we knew every month when we showed up to this court, there was a chance with just a word, they would take her from our arms and we would, mm. we would be done in her life. And so we went to court each month, loving her more than the month before. And after 18 months of this, I'll never forget. We walked into the courtroom and uh, here's this, you know, almost two year old thriving, little blonde haired, beautiful little girl. And I'll never forget it. They start and the judge looks up from the table, kind of drops his pen and he goes, can we all, it got really informal Ed. it was beautiful. I'll never forget it really informal. The judge just drops his pen and goes, can we all just, can everybody just turn around and look at this family back here? And like the whole courtroom turns around and he goes, can we all just be done with this nonsense and agree that that little girl is with her mom and dad. And that is the safest place that she'll ever be right there with them. And he goes, I'm done with this. And he awarded us full like he, that little girl became a hornback on that day. Did you uh, did, he, did you sign the birth certificate? Yeah, that, that all had to happen at a later hearing. But yeah, it came to the point where it, it came around and we even changed her name. 
and uh, to what we were calling her, Lenny. Her full name is Lennon, but we we just kind of changed her name, and there was just this beautiful moment where I was like, "Wow, Lord!" Like private adoption with my first daughter, foster care and adoption with my second daughter. I'm holding. I'm standing there with my family. And I was just like, what a testament to the amazing grace of God, oh, right? Yeah. And you know what's so beautiful about it, the power of this, is that everybody pay attention. God's plan from the beginning of time is to adopt all of us. That's right. <laughs> I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters. And so adoption is God's <laughs> plan of building his family. That's right. Right? It is. And so the the best the mirror of the of the gospel of Jesus is when oh, we're man. motivated to participate. That is such an amazing I, I gotta tell you this little story. Yeah. I just had a, a guest on in one of my earlier podcasts. Incredible story. He was number eight in the birth line. And oh, wow. at the hospital, after his wife gave birth, the father, who's a pastor, walks in and says, my sister's been trying to have a baby. Why don't we have so many children? Why don't we give this little boy oh my to my gosh. sister? Whoa. And on the birth certificate, it, she will be the mother and father and never know about us. Oh, my gosh. Think about what a father's choice would be so that someone else could have a baby. Wow. Well, anyway, when he, when he turned, you know, 17, 18, he found out about it, got really angry. Why would, mm. why would you know, my dad give me away? And so as they do, as they get older, and finally— you know, went through a really bad, was a bouncer in in Las Vegas at a big hotel. Wow. Big guy, 350-pound guy, you know, angry, going through life because of this. Why would my dad do something like this? And his right. sister called and said, you just got to come to church with us. Just tears me <laughs> up before we even start. Uh, it's Easter Sunday. We want you to come. He said, okay. He shows up. Sits on the front row with seven other siblings he's never seen. His father right next to him and his mother. And he's sitting there and the preacher Ooh. sermon comes out and he goes, what kind of person would give away his only son? Oh, man. To someone else. <laughs> That's the there greatest love story there ever was. And oh, this man. guy gets up, falls on his face, and gives his life to Jesus. Oh, my God. And his gosh, daddy is just man, crying. Incredible. And completely reunited the family, right? Wow. With his mom and dad. And now has he lost like, uh, you know, 180 pounds. He's a fitness mm. trainer, just an incredible guy. But he realized how much God loved us by giving his only son. Oh, my goodness. That is amazing. <laughs> Isn't that wild? But that's the power I, of love, right? Yeah, you can't make that stuff up. No. I mean, that's what, that's what the love of God does. And, exactly you know, and that just right. reminds me, like, I shared this with you, Ed, too, but— uh, you know, in the in the foster care sort of adoption system, especially in Nevada, um, it's unbelievably strict and also super huh. broken, as it is in most places. Um, but I remember uh, as uh, we were moving forward with with the adoption, we would have some caseworkers come in, and uh, of course, me and my wife we're sitting there, we're just beaming, right? Because we just oh, we just see the Lord all through this, and we're just beaming and. And they, they get really serious and, and they say, okay, so, and they're doing their, their boards and their clipboards. And she looks at us and she goes, this question is very important and very serious. And we're like, okay, all right, let's, let's get straightened up. And she goes, how are you planning on how or 
or are you planning on telling your girls that they were adopted? And they said, because, I mean, look at their, their, they look different. One is more Hispanic. The other is blonde hair, blue eyed. They're going to ask all these questions. And, and they were like really, really concerned about this. And, and they kind of finished and I, and I just looked at them and I said, oh, um, well, we've all, that's actually pretty easy for us. And, and they were like, what do you mean? And I said, well, we've been telling them since we got them, since they were babies, And they say, what do you mean? And I said, well, the beautiful thing about following Jesus and being Christians is that adoption is something we all share, not just something they (laughs) share. Come on, brother. And and they're looking right at us. And my wife's looking at me and I'm like, this is a gospel moment right here. So I just said, well, I said, not only every night when I'm praying, do I thank God that I got to be their dad? that that I got to adopt them into my family and call me my own. But I tell them and have for months, I say, God, thank you for mom's adoption. Thank you that grandma and grandpa, Nene and Pops adopted mom and chose to be, chose to love her and bring her into their family. And I said, and then I say, God, thank you that you adopted dad too. And that before the foundation of the world, you chose me to be your son and adopted me into your family. And I did. I just went. I went full gospel on it. That is just profound. And they looked at me. I finished. And I was just like, just so I was like worshiping God for the beauty of the gospel. And and they finished. They looked at me, looked down at their clipboard and they go, hmm. Okay, so religious. That's all they wrote. Yeah, <laughs> but it, like, the, until hey. they get and, and <laughs> until they get it, but in the telling oh, yeah. of the story, who knows what happened to that social worker? Oh, I'm telling you, I, I still I still know them, and I you know I've been praying ever since because I'm not ashamed of the gospel, and I was like, oh, how am I going to oh, navigate it? You got to say that I'm the the not ashamed of the gospel. <laughs> 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 That's it, man. I was oh, like, I, it's my Ken story. Hutcherson. Ken Hutcherson, who was uh, in heaven now, middle first African American middle linebacker for the Dallas Cowboys, and then went to Seattle Seahawks. He had a church in um, in Seattle, Washington. Can you believe it? Called the Antioch Ooh. Bible Church, and he had a shirt that he would make on the back that said "Sinister Minister." <laughs> mm. <laughs> he would preach the gospel. But the Lord spoke to him that he, w- he wanted them to shut down the, the whole social service program for children in Seattle because it was so corrupt. So he got mm. all of the families in his church to adopt children. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And they went, I, I can't remember the last number I heard, but they adopted over 300 children out of the system. And the the social service system was suing them because they weren't getting (laughs) any funding because there were no children for them to take care of. They're getting them out of the system and putting them in homes. He got death threats, everything, right? Because he figured that, well, God adopted us (laughs) when we were messed up. Right. Right. And he fully knew how broken we would be until we received yeah. our adoption and got born again. Yeah. So why don't we as a church just go adopt all these children? Matt, to, I hear that. Ed, two things come to mind. Number one, by God's grace, may that be true of my church and every church. Amen. Like, God, would you please do it? We're, we're, we're actually next month where Living Stones Churches has a, a ministry called Foster the City. And it is a beautiful partnership with other gospel preaching churches uh, to to do just that. Like, hey, I got, a, I got somebody you got to talk to. You know? I got somebody you got to talk to. Ted Yeoman. Okay. He's one of the leading adoption attorneys in the country. He's a guy oh, wow. that led to Christ 23 years ago on Easter Sunday morning. Oh, wow. In my church all these years changed all of his practice to being an adoption attorney. He's an amazing man. And he places kids on, uh, he gets all these gals who are in prison, who are going to be in prison. 
And he places all those children in families. And he Man. made it so it's really affordable for people to get those kids and add them to godly homes. Does he do, would, does he work outside of California? Yeah, like, I, he works all over the country. Oh my goodness. You have, for real, I need to be in touch. I, with I, Ted Yeoman, I'll give you his contact because wow, he, thank you. he would probably fly in and speak to your group of churches about how they can get in process. And he does this thing where he feels like adoptive parents, they get this opportunity to rewrite right. father's history and the mother's history of those children by adopting them into a family and connecting them to God, the Father, and Jesus. So they're rewriting family stories from heartbreak and you're going to be just like your dad in prison to yep, yep. you're going to change the world. Yep. Wow. Man, that is, I mean, that's the, <laughs> that's it. The rewriting the story. You know, you mentioned something, Ed, right before you said that. Um we, one of the things that we dealt with through our adoption journey and literally the rewriting the story of these two little girls, I can tell you this, my, my six-year-old daughter, Finley May, uh, her birth father at the time was the second most wanted man in the Reno Sparks, Nevada area for uh, sex crimes. Uh, and he was in prison, her birth father. Mm. So you want to talk about rewrite a story. Second, my my daughter Lennon, her her birth father was never actually found. They DNA tested, I think, over 19 guys uh, within a couple hundred miles, never found him. Uh, And so you're talking about rewriting a story here. Um, But then one of the things you mentioned briefly that I think is so important to mention in this is that, you know, the love of adoption, the love that rewrites a story is never an easy, cushy love. It is a hard, sacrificial, messy, difficult kind of love. Like not only in the love of the gospel that rewrites our story ends up with a bloody Jesus on a cross, but the love in foster care and adoption is also very difficult. And the world tries to use that to discourage you. When we got our daughter Lennon in the car seat, she was fresh out of the hospital. She had 13 narcotics in her system. She was seven weeks old. She was seizing. Uh, She was sick. I mean, she was sick. You would look at her and cry. And as we pursued her, people in our lives, even some people in our family said, you don't understand what this could be or mean for your life. You don't know the problems she could have. That, and, and I know some of it, Ed, I know was motivated by love. I know that some people were, tr- were truly trying to care for us, but they well, were saying, sort of you don't like know the what love, Their love was centered in, I could never do that. Right. Well, yeah, if your love is eros or your love is right. parental love, but right. what kind of God who gives us unconditional love chose us messed up of no yep. use, Romans says, dead in our city. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nothing to offer. Throwaways. Like, yeah. I'm like, as if God looked at me through the corridors of history and said, mm, that's a good kid. He's going to be a- easy to love. He's going to be so well behaved. I, he's never going to get sick or doubt. I choose him. I'm like, that's, that's not the gospel. The gospel is in all of my mess. Christ says, you're mine. Right. I, and, and so I said, that's what the love we have for this girl is. And all of this potential mess, which by the way, God is so good. Nothing that was said about her is true. Not even to this day. None of the social issues, none of this, like all the stuff they said was going to be so wrong with her is not. Uh, thanks be to God. But we so, just told our so family. And if our friends, you have a present loving father and mother in the life of a broken child, that child is not genetically disposed to having a screwed up life. Is that what you're saying? Imagine imagine that. (laughs) We went through, we went through two, I mean, what was it? 48 hours, I mean, of intense classes to, to become foster licensed. One whole day, Ed, was about how devastating 
a lot of these children are going to be physically and mentally. It was all about bracing your, I, I hated the class because it was so negative. It was so defeating, but here's what was incredible. After 12 hours, Ed, of them telling this room of potential foster parents, the literal nightmare that they were about to get into with some of these children who were fetal alcohol or abused at the very end of 12 hours of negativity, this thing pops up on the screen. And this was how the class ended. It was like, so all of this terrible stuff. And then this phrase pops up, but never underestimate the healing power of a loving home. And then the class ended. And I was like, okay, we should have split the hours. We should have been six hours on everything's terrible and the other six hours on the power of a loving home. What healing properties are found when a child is loved and wanted and safe and belongs? That I did not get enough said time. The power of a loving father and mother. Oh, oh of course. Right. Well, hey, good, listen, right? I got a little nugget for you. Okay. You and your wife are going to have to to really navigate. You've already started in a powerful way. But mm. the whole secret of the future of the teenage years mm. is getting is positioning your daughters to receive their adoption for mm. themselves. What yeah. they've started to wow. receive is you guys are bigger than life. But as you are aware that they got stuff in them that's going to kick in gear, questions, it's, it's keeping close enough to where there's no wall of bitterness or separation so that they ultimately, you know, even at, you know, when, and I don't know, did you get my book, The Difference a Father Makes, by the way? Yeah, you sent me the link for that. Yeah, right. I'm going to get that. Part of part of what that does is if you are able to maintain their hearts all the way mm. through high school, they're going to want you to go to the dance with them and not a pretender. Oh, sure. Wow. Yeah. Right. You become the man that they choose one day. And so mm. you keep their heart because there's a, there's a process that parents emotionally get into where they go, you know, when they're in an adoptive process where they raise, they say, I've raised them in a Christian home. And so I sure. say, really, are the walls born again? <laughs> the studs born again? Or oh, what, what, you know, what, what was different about your house and my house? I just have a regular house. I don't have like, right. a, my house isn't saved yet. I'm always working on it. Termites are coming in. I mean, and they, they sure. laugh. But I said, it's, it's really the environment that you're aware as a dad that you make sure the bitterness doesn't slip in there. And so there is mm. a lot of work as they're emotionally navigating their teenage years. Man. And and when what and you just remember this conversation because, you know, kind of armed with that and understanding that just like we do with God, where there's been a lot of kids who, you know, they got saved in church as kids but they never were nurtured because they were isolated. Mm. And then in high school, they got sideways because they got disconnected. And the most powerful thing you can do as a mom and dad is to, is to, as a father especially, is monitor the heart of your daughters all the way through their teenage years. I love that. And so it's questions like, how am I doing as your dad? Mm. Right? Is there something? Man, I'm telling you, that's that's not you. that's not getting asked. You know, <laughs> most like guys that, don't ask like, that. Yeah, we're volunteering. You know, how are you doing as my daughter? But we're not asking how am I doing as your dad. I mean, that's a that's a powerful question, right? Yeah, there, that's man. a man sized question. And if they go sideways, here's the other question: I could tell that you're doing this to me. Is there mm. something that I did that I haven't asked for forgiveness for yet? Mm. And Man. when you do that, even to your wife, oh she'll yeah, go, she'll she'll go like this. Really, right? <laughs> right. You want to know? And I, and then to my wife, I say, 
you're only allowed to to mention one or two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like you be give easy me the list. <laughs> you give me the list, and you're a little being a little emotional right now. You're gonna hit me with a bazooka, gonna blow me oh, up, yeah. and you'll find me in the garage hiding in a project. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, just yeah. like one or two. But that question, Man. you know, help me understand how I hurt you. What did I do so Daddy can ask for forgiveness? Modeling mm. that all the way through those teenage years, you'll maintain connection with their heart, and guess what will happen? They won't look for another daddy to rescue them. Right, man. Because they got you. That's so good. I, it reminds me of that. I don't know who said it, but it reminds me of a quote I heard. It said, uh, dads, uh, be the chief repenters in your home because you're likely the chief sinner. Yeah, and, it is. Uh, I thought, man, like even with my girls, I, I shared this with you when we talked before this, but I, I'm thankful that I've been able by God's grace to have that attitude as they're little of even when I parent in anger, I make it a point to go in and say, hey, you know, dad, I'm not sorry for what I asked you to do or that you needed to obey because you do, because dad knows what's best for you right now. But I, I've apologized. I'm sorry for getting angry. I dad parented out of angry, out of anger, and I need you to forgive me. Can you please forgive me? And uh, now that they're five and six, like they expect it, and I think it's a beautiful thing to expect somebody. And then when, when they and you wait till they tell you, you. yeah, and, and see what you, you know what you did, which is so powerful, brother. You've just created a culture of forgiveness in your family story mm. that it's not okay to go to bed angry yeah. and leave it there. Yeah. Because right. that anger will turn into bitterness and then get into the root. And then all of a sudden the fruit of that life gets bitter. Yeah. And Man, so that, I mean, that's, that's so one true. of my missions with men is I ask them, how are you doing asking for forgiveness? Well, I tell her I'm sorry, which I'll right. say, then you're a sorry person. Right. No, no, no. Sure. I apologize. Yeah. But did you look at her and say, boy, I can tell I really hurt you. Would you tell me how much it hurt so I can ask mm. for forgiveness? That's man size. And when you do that That's right. and they tell you and you look at them and go, will you forgive me? I was totally yeah. wrong. Yeah, man. What that does is she looks at you like, whoa. Yeah. And see, most men go, sorry. I just having a bad day, you know. You're right. Had too many yeah. beers, said something in anger, didn't mean anything. That's just a piled higher, deeper wound that mm -hmm. children are navigating. But when you say, will you forgive me? That's powerful words, man. And you know the way we can do that, by the way, you know that, preacher man. We got to be forgiven ourselves. Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. We go to Jesus and he never goes, well, finally, Nathan... Right. <laughs> you know how long I've been mentioning this to the Holy Ghost and he's been reminding yeah. you? No kidding. He doesn't, because while we were still dead in our sin, Romans 5, 8 says, Christ died for us. When we were useless, That's right. way before we were born, he went, it is finished. Yep. Christ, Thanks this be to God. Been so rich just being with you, Nathan. Just the love, your heart, just... Uh, because, you know, uh, what would happen if we could light men on fire all over your city, all over our states and nations, mm. that there's fathers in towns who want kids yeah. that nobody wants. This whole issue that's being waged with the abortion thing, back and forth, mm -hmm. would it be different with girls who get pregnant mm. if there was a loving man there and said, man, I'm sorry, sorry got you pregnant, but I'm, I'm in for their whole yeah. life to be man. your father? Ugh. What would happen? What would happen? What would Everything would change. <laughs> Everything. So the Everything answer before the grain coming day of the Lord, 
God's sending out Elijah's brother, and and what's the message we mm. have? We're, he's turning the hearts of us back to our kids. That's right. Hearts of Man, fathers. Thanks be to God. And and fathers to children. Man, we I know that there are people right now that are feeling convicted, but also going. Maybe we should consider adopting a child. Yeah. Maybe we should we should get into foster care, no matter what they're saying. Um, ma- ma- wow, what what a story! Why don't Why don't you sh- uh, throw a prayer out to those guys that are watching, who are saying they might even be saying, "I'm going to give up on this kid in foster care. He's too mm. hard." Mm. So why, why don't you pray for them right now? I'd love to, man. Uh, God, we just come before you, God, um, as our father, the perfect father. Um, God, and I just pray if there is somebody listening to this um, who is one, if they are feeling convicted, God, I pray that you would send your spirit who you said is the comforter, that he would bring truth and guidance and comfort and peace into a struggling heart. Um, God, I pray that by your grace, you would you would bring a a level of peace and love that leads to endurance as they look at you and pursue you. Um, God, I pray that for those who are considering fostering or adopting, Mm. um, that you would, you would give them the grace to step towards that, to step into a kind of messy, but beautiful worthwhile love. That is the love of the gospel. Um, God, I pray that they would want, as Ed said, beautifully, uh, to be a part of rewriting the story uh, of, of a child's life um, and rewriting a story where there yes, was once likely brokenness or hopelessness into joy and salvation and amazing grace. And so, God, would you just do that? Uh, would you lead somebody even now as we pray, even now as they listen, uh, to contact a foster care agency in their community and take a step of faith forward? Uh, Would you do that? And God, would you do it not only for the good of children, but for your ultimate glory, that the world would look at at the church and at believers, and and they would not just say, what a great people, but they would look at us and say, they have a great Savior. Um, So God, would you please do that in us and through us and in the lives of those listening? Mm. Um, We love you and we trust you uh, to be the God of miracles that you are. So make a way for the lives of and stories of many children to be saved and rewritten uh, in amazing grace. And we just mm. love you. And we ask you to do it uh, for your name's sake. In Jesus name, we pray. Mm. Amen. Amen. Woo. What a, what a, what a podcast with you, my brother. Thank you what? so much for being willing to talk with me. Ed. It's hey, been a joy, man. I'm, I'm excited to just uh, get to know you more and, this incredible mission. Oh, Father, thank you. So if this has blessed you today, we also have a free gift for you. Um, of the book, The Difference a Father Makes, that we're going to make available to you digitally as soon as you sign up. And we'll put the link in the bio. Make sure you check out Nathan and his church and just uh, show up on Sunday morning for some of their online services. He says he's got something, man. He's one of those. uh, He's figured out that since he's adopted, why doesn't he figure out just adopt some himself? (laughs) I love it. Let's go. Oh, man. Oh, my. So good. My mind's spinning. So bless you guys. Thanks for being a Man of Honor podcast. We're here to highlight and lift up godly men who are making a difference in their world, in the community, in their family, with their kids, with their adoptive kids. And so keep tuning on. Share this with your friends. God bless you. Remember, it's never too late for you to have the story that God has always wanted you to have. God bless you.